presentation today. Uh, it is a very heavy presentation. I'm going to go through like a bunch of, uh, there are a lot of pictures. I want it to be as interactive as possible because it is not a, it is not a very easy topic to touch. So uh, without any further ado, let's get into it. Um, so subsea production systems, I am going to cover four main topics um, to give you an appreciation of what a subsea production system is and uh, what are the different components, subsystems of a subsea uh, production system, how does it operate um, and how we complete these subsea production wells. It's a very complex operations, usually spread, spread over the period of decade. Uh, and it's, it's, it, I, sometimes I jokingly say things that it is rocket science right here on earth. Um, the level of complexity, the level of uh, resources that are required when we do the, these subsea completions and subsea uh, systems is, is just immense. So I can I ask a question? Just a quick sure. question. How many people in the world really know how to do this? Very specialized people, very specialized providers. Uh, we can actually name on name them on hand. It's it's so. Are specific. you are you are you one of the experts who have worked in this field? I have not not the entire system, but some parts of the system. So you're saying if, if somebody wanted to really learn this, it would be an absolutely incredible opportunity to develop this knowledge. Definitely. There are not okay. many people who would give you this kind of uh, uh, knowledge firsthand. Wow. See, yep. yeah, I get I get the picture. OK, thank you. All right. So uh, at the end of this module, you will be able to describe a very basic subsea production system. Um, if you see if you will see the, uh, the, the subsea structures in real life, you will be able to outline some of them. Uh, you will be able to appreciate what the deep water subsea operations look like. Uh, distinguish between different type of layouts, basic configurations, equipment, subsystems. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on uh, what are the different major com contracts that may make up a subsea development. Um, this is just to give you an idea about uh, the quantum of the operations, how many contractors are usually involved, and uh, who takes what portion of the development. So um, what is essentially a subsea production systems? It is collection of equipment technology that is required to extract oil and gas, hydrocarbons per se, from the subsea reserves. Um, subsea production systems are sometimes very, very customized. That means they are customized to the customer, they are customized to a particular field, they're customized to the operating conditions. And as we go further in the slides, you will see that there are some subsea uh, production systems that are developed specific to uh, area, to a geography, depending upon um, how deep your uh, development is, what kind of natural calamities that can occur over there. Um, for example, um, a different type of uh, um, icy conditions. So that can actually determine your, your size, your quantum, your design of the subsea production systems. Um, what are the different type of uh, subsea equipment we are going to talk about? We are going to see this in, in a bit of more detail, but we are going to talk about subsea production systems, manifolds. We are going to talk about manifolds quite a lot. We are going to talk about uh, um, subsea pumps, wellheads, flow lines. If people, if some of you actually attended my previous uh, lecture, we've talked about drilling and completions, and most of that uh, knowledge was centered about onshore operations. But this is kind of builds up on that knowledge that if you understand the onshore operations, you will be able to pick up um, the subsea operations because uh, they are very much alike, but very much different as well. Um, and the, essentially the, the purpose of the subsea production system is to extract hydrocarbon from the seabed or subsea uh, through a pipeline to an onshore facility. If, is, if there is a piece of land available nearby, uh, I'm talking about hundreds of kilometers. If it's not, if it's in the middle of nowhere, then we have offshore processing facilities 
uh, which are huge, which will process this hydrocarbon to a point where you can actually transport it through ship to an onshore facility for further processing. Um, some of the terminologies and acronyms, uh, temp we are going to see them in a bit more details in the form of picture, um, but I want to build on some of that knowledge that whenever I'm talking about a template, it essentially is a structure uh, that is used to precisely locate the wells in a very close proximity to each other on a sleeve floor. Then uh, the wells are drilled through this template structure and then the wellheads and the trees are actually installed on this template. So this template can be an eight well template. So you will drill through this eight well template and then you will install a lot of that subsea structure onto those templates to complete these wells. Subsea tieback, essentially whenever I'm talking about the subsea tieback, uh, it is just a well or a drill center that is connected to a production infrastructure. Usually your production infrastructure is that bit away from your drill center or your well. So a tieback is essentially, essentially a flow line or a piece of pipe that is connecting a drill center or a well to the production uh, infrastructure. A drill center is essentially a collection of wells, a group of wells on a seafloor. They are very close proximity to each other. They can be on a single template. They can be different from a single template. So they can be far bit away from each other, but still they are clustered around uh, a single manifold. So that's why they are called a drill center. Um, and when we talk about drill center, we call it a drill center because essentially the, the drilling rig will uh, center it, itself around a drill center so that it can drill those wells and it does not have to move or it does not have to alter or reset its mooring pattern. Um, in the deeper waters, the wells, vessels do not utilize mooring systems. Uh, just because it's so deep. So we use a system which is called DP or dynamic positioning. Uh, dynamic, dynamic position systems is essentially a computer control system, which is tied with a, a very, very accurate set, satellite telemetry systems. So uh, consider your, uh, your GPS and your phone. This is just a very, very advanced version where they're trying to position a vessel within, within just a meter sometimes less than that because we don't want too much of a of a, uh, a difference. Uh, so it's automatically uh, maintaining the vessel position. And uh, so uh, in my previous uh, lecture, I mentioned about dynamic thrusters, propellers and thrusters. So they are around this drill ship and they are automatically trying to, to center it without much of a human intervention. Um, a field layout, whenever, whenever I'm talking about a field layout, essentially it's a drawing which will show you an entire field. It can comprise of a multiple drill centers and it will show you pipelines, umbilicals, uh, uh, manifolds, things like that. And a satellite well, essentially, as the name suggests, it's a single well, which is actually located from um, far away from a production center, which is tied back uh, using a dedicated flow line. Subsea production tree, I will not go in a lot of details regarding subsea production tree. This is a subsea evolution of your onshore tree, just a combination of valves, spools. Um, it can be uh, onshore, it is called a Christmas tree. Offshore, it is called, called a subsea production tree. There are two types of trees available. One is called a horizontal tree and the other one is called a vertical tree as the name suggests. In the horizontal tree, the the uh, valves are usually uh, stacked up in a horizontal way in a vertical tree, it's stacked up in a vertical way. Uh, kind of depends upon your, uh, on your template, customer preference, their previous experience. Uh, both of these types of trees are available. Uh, it's a complex set of valves that are used to control the hydrocarbons uh, from the subsea reservoir. Uh, they have uh, lower master valves, upper master valves, your, your swabs and your, uh, your wing valves, essentially to control your uh, wellbore fluid. Um, it is part of a subsea, permanent or subsea structure. You cannot pull it easily. Uh, it, is, it is usually installed as a part of completing the well. And um, it is 
the, the amount of trees that we need to install in a template or in a, in a field, it is very well planned in advance, uh, ordered in advance, tested in advance, and then it is usually moved through uh, uh, installation vessel um, on top of your uh, field. And then from there, it's lowered onto the subsea surface. Um, a lot of these connections, which you will see uh, on, on here, these are operated. Some of these, for example, these ones, which you see up in a triangle over here, these are operated through something which is called a remotely operated vehicle. Uh, which you can see right on your pictures. Uh, a remotely operated vehicle is essentially, uh, uh, there is no person in it. Uh, it is usually controlled through a series of cables uh, from the top side or from a drill ship. It will have a couple of arms and these arms can actually manipulate the controls on uh, a subsea tree. Um, it is used not only for controls. Um, uh, sometimes you have to open certain valves, although the tree can be controlled from the top side. You don't have to have a ROV right there on the tree all the time, but for some of the maintenance activities for some, opening some of the particular valves, uh, you need ROV or a remotely operated vehicle. It's a very specialized operation. The people are, that are trained on the ROV operations. Uh, this is, these are ROVs are particularly used for very deep sea applications, but for the shallow water applications, you can actually have divers diving all the way to the, to the subsea tree and operating the valves. Uh, but for more of the more of the complex and demanding operations, we use ROVs. So a subsea pump is essentially, there are a couple of things that I want to mention on this slide. Uh, you will have your subsea trees, which you can see over here, your wellheads or your, or your trees. These are connected through flow lines or jumper, jumpers, as we call them in the industry, to a manifold. And let me show this. You know. So you will have your manifold over here. And from the manifold, you will have jumpers connecting it to a pump, a pumping system. Um, essentially, the premise is that uh, there is enough well pressure to push the fluid all the way to the manifold. But if you are pumping it to the onshore facility or offshore facility, you might need what we call a pumping skid. Uh, this pumping skid usually sometimes is made of uh, electrical submersible systems because they are actually designed to be fully immersed in a fluid. Uh, and they are run by, uh, by electrical power that is provided from the top side. Uh, and uh, essentially, um, subsea pumping has been around for quite some time. Now we are getting to a point where we are actually seeing subsea compression. So uh, transporting gas to a, to an onshore facility, we are using subsea compression. That means you will have a compressor that is sitting right on the seabed, and then it will compress it, send it to a topside facility. Uh, it's a very new, new uh, technology right now but subsea pumping have been there for, for, for decades now. Um, it is installed as part of your uh, 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 a permanent structure. It is usually installed downstream of the manifold. That means your wells are tied to your manifold and then your manifold is tied to your pumping, uh, pumping unit. Um, and then you have what we call subsea distribution units. We are going to talk about those in a bit more detail. Uh, but you see it's a very standard room kind of operation um, where we have all these flow lines, your hydraulic and electrical termination lines um, connecting different parts of the development. Then your wellhead, uh, your wellhead essentially is very much similar to your onshore wellhead. Uh, and the purpose of wellhead is to prevent onshore controlled exposure of the hydrocarbons up on the surface. Uh, there are so many things that a wellhead is doing. Uh, from the wellhead, you have your conductor casings, your intermediate casings that are heading through a, through a hanger. And then the wellhead also contains your tubing hanger. So your production tubing is actually tied to your uh, uh, tubing hanger. Uh, it essentially acts as an interface between your tree and your BOP. Uh, with the formation. So if you are in a production mode, then you will you will have a Christmas tree, but if you are in a drilling mode, you will have your blowout preventer uh, 
and it acts as interface between the two. Uh, it's a pressure control system. It is designed to have certain specifications. A lot of those are determined by API standards, which are uh, standards developed by, but developed by American Petroleum Institute. Uh, and we strictly, whether it's a manufacturer or installer, strictly follows those API specifications to make sure that they are developed to a certain standards and tested to a certain standard as well. Uh, as I mentioned, it is there to support, apart from interface between the BOP or the wellhead with the formation, it is also there to support your casings and that are deployed to the formation. Uh, a subsea completion string, whenever we are talking about it, it is just an essentially a, com a composition of your casing, your tubing, uh, your wellhead, and then your Christmas tree or your uh, Subsidiary, uh, it is selection of tubulars, equipment uh, running all the way from downhole to the surface. A downhole, you have your packers, which is uh, essentially to pack off uh, between the space between your tubing and casing. Uh, but um, your subsea completion string would look like something like this, where you have either single pay zone or multiple pay zones. This is a single example of a single pay zone where you have a set of perforations and it can be a dual pay zone where there are two set of per perforations and both of these perforations are actually isolated uh, by a series of packers between them. Uh, packer has those uh, uh, rubber elements that will isolate the annulus and uh, um, so your subsea completion spring will essentially make up of all of these downhole completions and your top side completions. Uh, since there is a concept of double to triple redund redundancies in uh, um, triple re redundancies in terms of um, uh, to prevent any equipment failures. So we have what we call a subsurface safety valve which is to isolate your formation from, uh, from your railhead uh, in case uh, there, is, uh, there is a disaster. Disaster is a very, a very tough word to use. If you want to isolate your formation from your uh, top side structure, you will use a subsurface safety valve. And then your formation isolation valve. Uh, today, my focus is more on the subsea developments and subsea production systems rather than what kind of downhole tools that we use. So, um, but just to give you a flavor of what a, a subsea completion string actually looks like. And then blow preventer, this is something, uh, a piece of equipment that we use on, on, op on offshore, on the offshore as well as onshore operations. Uh, it is essentially used whenever we are uh, intervening in the well for some work over or where we are drilling. When we are producing, we don't have a BOP. Uh, we effectively replace a BOP with your subsea tree, a production tree. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, one of the critical pieces of the equipment that prevents an uncontrolled exposure of hydrocarbons. Uh, from the well into the surface, into the into the sea. Uh, so it's uh, they are they are developed and that's tested to a very strict regulations, and they have essentially what we call ESD emer uh, emergency shutdown devices uh, in the form of different type of rams. So we have pipe rams and shear rams. Pipe rams and shear rams. If, if some of you attended my previous presentation. Um, essentially, they are isolate shear rams as, as, as the name suggests. The shear ram will cut a drill string and isolate. It will totally isolate uh, a well uh, for having any uncontrolled uh, exposure of those hydrocarbons. Uh, and then we have annular rams as well that are to uh, uh, isolate that annular surface between your drill string or your drill pipe and your casing. So. A deep water operation, um, uh, there are different dynamics, there are different levels of uh, when we start talking about the deep water operations. Uh, essentially, when you have in waters deeper than 100 meters, then your drilling and completion operations are usually uh, conducted by two types of vessels. 
Uh, one of them are called semi-submersible rigs and the other ones are called drill ships or drilling ships. Uh, Semi-submersibles are uh, can be dynamically positioned as well. Sometimes they are actually moored to the seafloor. Uh, drill ships commonly come with a dynamic positioning. Essentially, uh, what we are doing over here is that in the floating vessels, whether it's a semi-submersible or a drill ship, it is constantly in a move. Uh, with respect to your datum point, that means uh, your sea where it's constantly moving, it's constantly adjusting with respect to, to the waves. Uh, so it's uh, essentially what we want is that there is so much redundancy and safety factors that are built up in these systems that uh, you want to disconnect, you want to, in case there is, uh, there is a storm coming, you effectively want to disconnect uh, from the well bore, and that is one of the clear, their critical feature to ensure a safe operation. Uh, how do you connect? So you have your subsea uh, structure, uh, subsea infrastructure on the seabed. How do you how do you connect this seabed with respect to your drill ship or your semi submersible? So that piece of equipment in between a piece of long pipe to understand it in a in a more easier terms is called what we call a riser. So it acts like a passageway for your uh, completion string or your drill, drill pipe. Uh, and we have disconnect systems at, uh, on the risers that will prevent, that will let the semi-submersible or drill ship disconnect and move away from your, uh, uh, either your production phase or your drilling phase. And there is enough flexibility that is built in the, in the risers as well to have that motion compensation between your uh, between your uh, vessel and your fixed uh, BOB. Um, there are four major type of contracts uh, and essentially I've dedicated just one slide on the contracts just for you to appreciate how, how complex it is. But uh, because going forward, we are going to focus more on the subsea production systems, different type of templates and different type of developments. So um, there are four types of contracts. There is a drilling contract, which is given to a drilling contractor uh, to have a semi-submersible or a drill ship uh, to be on place. Uh, they will either develop, they will either do drill exploration wells where they will do some appraisals and uh, some testing to see whether it is even worth to develop this huge subsea field. If it's not economical, they will cap those wells, they will do a plug and abandonment, abandonment campaign, and they will, they will call it a day. Uh, but essentially a drilling contract is there to travel, develop some exploration wells, see how do they perform. And if, it, if it's worth developing that field, then we will start developing what we call production wells. Then we have subsea production systems contract. Essentially, you will provide your manifold, your pressure controlled equipment, everything that is going to go on the seafloor, uh, as well as uh, topside production equipment that will allow the operator to uh, safely produce those hydrocarbons to the surface. Then you have your floating FPSO contracts, floating production storage and offloading contracts. This is when the field is developed, it's mature, it's producing, then you want these contracts to uh, uh, provide people, equipment, uh, that will house those, those uh, uh, all the resources. And essentially uh, that's where we start producing them on a more economical scale. And the UFR contract, so that is the umbilical flow lines and riders, risers contracts. This is essentially your subsea infrastructure. There's a contractor that will be called out, what we call an installation contractor. Um, and that contractor will provide and install the pipelines, the umbilicals, uh, all your hydraulic uh, uh, control systems, your electric control systems, and your chemical injection to the subsea. Um, the UFR contractor typically owns produces, manufactures, installs, uh, uh, all these um, uh, subsidiaries and all the infrastructure that needs to go on the seabed floor, not 100% of the time, but majority of the time. And um, 
they will have those special installation vessels that will actually install all that onto the seabed. Uh, this is just a very quick uh, or a very high level uh, example of what a subsea production system essentially looks like. Um, what there are a few things that you can see over here. You can see your production rises right over here. As I mentioned, these are in a very, very, very simplistic terms. Uh, these are your uh, pieces of pipe that are connecting your subsidiary with your uh, FPSO, which is floating production, storage, and offloading vessel. Uh, this is very, very conceptual layout. This is not something which you uh, will actually see. Uh, uh, this is not from actual development, but it will give you an idea. Uh, it's a very extensive field with multiple drill centers, which you can see over here. This is what we call one drill center. You can actually see a couple of them. There is one over here, there's one over here, there's one over here, and then one followed by it. Uh, so uh, some of the main components that you can, you can see over here are essentially drill centers, your FPSO, which is out on the sea, sea surface, uh, and your flow lines, your control umbilicals, uh, production risers, and a shuttle tank. The shuttle tanker is essentially, there is some storage available on the FPSO for the hydrocarbons, but essentially when that storage is up to certain level, then you need to offload it to a shuttle tanker. Shuttle tanker will uh, take it to an onshore facility. So shuttle tankers are more commonly used in countries or areas where there are no pipelines or infrastructure on land. So they will take it to the nearest uh, production facility or the refining facility. Uh, and in this situation, the FPSO contractor have to get the production fluids to the market without relying on any onshore or the nearby onshore infrastructure. Uh, the shuttle tanker actually docks to a buoy which you can see out on the on the surface as well. And then it uses a hoses or a pipe to transfer oil from FPSO to the shuttle tanker. Uh, the shuttle tanker then disconnects and takes the oil to a location where uh, they will get the hydrocarbons to the market. Uh, this is kind of an appreciation between the different types of onshore, offshore, shallow water platforms Onshore operations, uh, as you can see, your uh, item item number one is your onshore rig, uh, just a typical land rig. Then for the shallow water operations, this is your item number two, where you have jackup rigs, which are generally in relatively very shallow waters, sometimes on the, on the continental shelf itself. And I'm talking about the shallow water, I'm talking about anything which is less than thousand feet. And then for, uh, Item number three, which is your deep water operations ranging all the way from 1,000 feet to 5,000 feet. That's where your semi-submersible will come in. And for your ultra deep water applications, which is your um, item number four, which are drill ships. And when I'm talking about ultra deep water uh, uh, operations, so this is something which is more than 5,000 feet from the seabed to, to, the, to the top side. And then uh, item number five, FPSOs, floating production, storage, and offloading vessels. These are just to store and offload uh, the production fluid. Um, I talked about uh, a drill center. Uh, there are a couple of uh, components of the drill center. This drill center illustrates a typical arrangement that includes your FLETs, your flow line and terminations. Uh, they are also sometimes referred to as pipeline uh, and terminations as well. Uh, effectively, what you can see right over here where my uh, laser pointer is pointing. Uh, and then we have what we call our uh, sorry, uh, control umbilicals. Then we have subsea uh, distribution units. Subsea distribution unit, we are going to discuss this in the coming slides as well. Subsea distribution unit is essentially your command center out on the seafloor, which is contro controlling your electrical power and hydraulic power. Um, and then your subsea trees, all of this equipment is actually clustered around a manifold. 
Um, so a manifold actually can connects a couple of subsidiaries. All of them actually come through a flow line or a jumper line. They, they are connected to a manifold. Uh, so that if a drill ship is moved or located over the drill center, the drill ship is able to move around and access all of the different subsea wells and trees. The jumper connects the subsea trees to the manifold where the flow is actually commingled. That, that means flow from different wells will actually mix in the manifold. And the, from the manifold, it will go through a jumper to a PLET, which is your pipeline or your flow line and termination from there. Uh, the flow lines are actually connected through the actual pipeline. So the PLETs are actually junctions where your jumpers are actually connected with your pipelines. And then uh, the two FLETs are connected with a loop, which, is a, which allow uh, with what we call picking operation. Uh, I'm not going to discuss in, in, in bit detail what picking is. It's done offshore and onshore. Essentially, when we talk about the picking operations, we are talking about there is a contraption that is installed in the pipeline that can actually clean the pipeline um, to prevent any buildup of sedimentation and corrosion. Um, what you see is a typical drill center. Uh, we will use very simple diagrams uh, to drill out how the subsea production systems are put together. So this animation is going to show you the installation of a basic subsea production systems with the satellite or a single well tieback. Um, we have, uh, first the well is drilled. Um, it's very much similar uh, how it's done onshore, but first uh, the well is drilled through the seafloor onto the reservoir. Um, the subsea tree is then installed on to the wellhead. Uh, the host facility, which you see over here, um, which is floating uh, and in some cases actually standing on the seafloor is then installed. This is followed by umbilical and production flow lines between the trees. Uh, and the host facilities. So your umbilical and flow lines between your trees and the flow uh, trees and your uh, host facilities. And then um, export line um, with, a large, with, a, with a large bowl to accommodate multiple well tiles is then installed to transfer oil and gas from the host facility to an onshore facility. Or if the onshore facility is not available, then uh, to what we call a shuttle tanker, which you saw in the previous slides. This is kind of a setup which works in a lot of uh, shallow water uh, installations like in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas, where the pipeline can go all the way to onshore. Uh, in a more uh, a deeper formations, such as in West Africa, the host facility may have to stand alone without interconnection. Uh, to an onshore facility, then as I mentioned earlier, the shuttle tanker will come and take it to the to the desired market. So um, this is a very, very, uh, this is a single well tie-in, very basic, uh, but as we start going into multi-well multi -well tiebacks, it becomes um, slightly more complex. Um, so what, uh, when the well is actually drilled, you will have, you will have to install your wellhead um, right on this on the seabed. Uh, sometimes the wellhead is not installed on the seabed; it is installed. So you will have your your casing going all the way to the surface and or the or the top of the of the sea where you will install your your wellhead as well. Um, there are two types of uh, subsea trees. Uh, what you see on your right-hand side is a very typical subsea tree. Uh, it is also called a Christmas tree. Uh, different geographies will have different ways of calling it, but essentially a subsea tree is a collection of valves which will contain and regulate the flow of the hydrocarbons. Uh, the trees will fit, will sit directly on top We control. So as I mentioned earlier, they will, uh, they're typically controlled from the top side, uh, but in certain conditions, we can have backup ROV controls as well. And the trees are designed for injection 
um, where the direction of the flow of hydrocarbons is reversed and the oil and gas is forced back into the formation as well. So they can actually produce hydrocarbons, but they can also inject different chemicals. So you will, they will have chemical injection arrangements. And in certain cases, they can actually reverse the flow of the hydrocarbon and extract it and inject it back into either the same well or uh, other wells which are drilled around them. So uh, there are multiple reasons why we do injection. This is sometimes done to increase the formation pressure. Um, sometimes when we don't have the facility to store natural gas or flare natural gas, then in that case, we actually re-inject that natural gas back into the reservoir as well. So they actually have production features as well as injection features just for these particular reasons. Um, your screen actually shows two different types of the same thing. Essentially, they do the same thing. Uh, the mud line tree on your left is for your shallow water applications. It is essentially very much similar to a sur surface tree or the onshore tree uh, that you see on a onshore hydrocarbon well, um, but they are adapted for the subsea uses. So you, they will have some remotely actuated valves uh, and then um, they will have some interfaces so that a, a diver can actually swim to it and operate it as well. The subsea tree and on the right is more typical of a subsea uh, infrastructure, and it is for the diverless operations or the deep water operations. Uh, there's no human interface on this tree, so uh, a human cannot dive to it and manipulate the controls. It has to be done through RO. RO. Uh, just an example of a real, real life tree, subsea tree. Uh, in this one, um, the panel that is out in the front has been removed to expose the valve actuators and the tubing has not been installed. This is still in the manufacturing facility. Without the panels, the valves, the valve block and the actuators can be actually seen over here. These are your actuators right over here. These are big hydraulic actuators. Uh, the ROV controls or interfaces are visible on the top of the cylinders as well. So if you see the brass colored uh, uh, ROV controls right over here, um, and these are called ROV controls or override interfaces as well in the industry. A very typical FPSO for floating production, storage and offloading vessel that we use, they will have like, it looks like a typical uh, tanker ship with a flare stack right here on your left-hand side. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit on the hydraulic and electrical controls between the trees and the host vessel. You have what we call electrical and hydraulic control lines from that are running from the host vessel to the host facility to the tree. Um, and there is a flow line for producing fluids and gas from the tree to the host facilities. The electrical um, and hydraulic control lines allow for the remote operation of the tree. You want it because you don't have a ROV right there on there all the time. You want that flexibility to control, shut in your well or open it up on, on, a, on your fingertips. So the control lines essentially opens the valves and allow the fl produce fluid to flow from the well head to the tree and then distribute it out through the pipeline. The pipeline provides the means of producing the fluid back to the host facility. Uh, where they can be pre-processed, as you mentioned, as some of you might know, that the reservoir produces hydrocarbons as well as water and gas. So you need to process them, separate them, so uh, you can actually uh, transport them in in different ways. A lot of times, the water, which we call a produce water from these wells, uh, it needs to go back into the export line or it can be rejected back into the reservoir as well. Uh, this illustration uses multiple well tieback. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my previous slide, it was a single well tieback. But as you start going into uh, more common subsea installations, you will see that single well tiebacks are far uh, and few in between. So multiple well tiebacks are usually very common. Um, this illustration uses multi-well tieback to show how the 
electrical flying leads and hydraulic flying leads, EFL and HFL connects the subsidiaries and manifolds to the subsidy distribution units. So your EFL electronic electric flying leads and hydraulic flying leads are connected to a subsidy distribution unit. Uh, this subsidy distribution unit is part of your drill center. Multiple well tiebacks are simply multiple wells tied together by production manifolds. The EFLs and HFLs uh, are laid out on the seafloor, so they are actually less resting on the seafloor. They're generally very flexible and installed using the ROVs. Uh, a lot of effort is actually made to prevent them from uh, crisscrossing each other. That is purely for the maintenance purposes, uh, so that if there is a maintenance condition on arise, one can be pulled without having to pull another one from the top. Uh, this is just a ex picture of, uh, this one is HF HFL, uh, which you can see in the real life. Uh, this is a HFL and EFL tied right to a subsidy production tree. Uh, you can see HFLs are usually quite, quite uh, less flexible than EFLs. EFLs, which you can see more like a, a, a flexible electrical line. Uh, the HFLs have stabs right over here, which you can see. Um, these are called ROV stabs. Uh, ROV will engage it, flies it over, and then it stabs it into the hole and engages it through a particular locking mechanism. Um, three other small EFL lines, electrical um, uh, uh, lines, which you can see over here as well. Then this is, uh, this picture actually shows how HFLs are connected to a subsea tree between the two flying leads, two HFL leads. You will see an empty slap stab plate with a cover over here. Uh, this cover is to protect the HFL connection when it is not used. Um, we talked about the jumper cables or not jumper cables. This will actually connect uh, a tree with a manifold. So uh, they are usually typically loaded on a barge and transported to a location where they, it is installed. Um, this actually shows two jumpers that are installed on a barge for transportation. Um, very, very, in a very simplistic terms, essentially the manifolds are used to tie back multiple wells to a single pipeline. In this, in this scenario, a PLET, uh, a pipeline uh, termination end is installed at the end of pipeline, a pipeline. Once the manifold and PLETs are connected, the jumpers are installed to connect each subsidiary to the manifold. Very simple, uh, uh, not much in terms of uh, how it is, has been described over here. Uh, this configuration allows additional wells, subsea wells to be added uh, that all tie into the production manifold. So everything will tie into production manifold. Uh, there is no limit, but usually what we see is a typical manifold connected to four, sometimes maybe six subsidiaries. Uh, there are typical types of field layouts. A satellite uh, type of, uh, is, is just a single well daisy chain are usually four or five uh, chains uh, each chain containing four or five, maybe sometimes six uh, wells, daisy chains to each other. Cluster, as I mentioned earlier, it's just clustered around a single manifold. And then template is uh, essentially, you will I have a picture towards end of my presentation where you will actually see a template as well. Um, I'm not going to go, I think we have uh, covered this in, in a bit more detailed as well. But typically, your control umbilicals, uh, your hydraulic and electrical control lines will connect to the uh, uh, subsidiaries. This is as it's actually a more realistic view of a drill center. So this is your manifold. These are your trees. This is your SDU or subsea uh, distribution unit. Or uh, these are all your ELTs or F, uh, H, H, HFTs and your EH, EFTs, uh, your electrical lines and your hydraulic lines connecting to a, a tree. Uh, this is a more realistic view. Uh, so 
this is what we call uh, interconnecting jumper. Um, essentially, uh, this is what, as I mentioned earlier, this is also called a daisy change conf con chained configuration. Once you have the pipeline installed and you have the manifold installed, uh, it will take the picking loop loop off. This is picking loop right over here. Uh, and you can actually connect this manifold with another manifold with another manifold. So you are daisy chaining them. Uh, essentially, it helps to reduce your uh, infrastructure costs and your uh, uh, pipeline cost as well. So this is what we call a typical six twelve manifold. Uh, this was particularly uh, the, the the one which you see out in the picture is the one which was which it is going to be a daisy chain. So there is no picking loop on it. Uh, the hubs uh, have what we call pressure caps on them. So you have pressure caps right on them. Uh, and this is to provide and protect the hubs in the subsea environment until they are going to be utilized. If you're going to look at the vessel, you will see there are two men standing right over here. So you can see how big this, it, this is. Uh, this is another example of a four-well manifold. This, uh, this is where you can see a pinging loop right over here. That means uh, later in the field development, this pinging loop will be removed and we are going to daisy chain this particular four-well manifold. FLETs or flow line and terminations, we talked about it. It is part of our, our, our drill center. Uh, these are also called pipeline and terminations as well. It will provide a uh, a tie back between the manifold and the flow line. Uh, these are a couple of examples of uh, things which we were looking in a more schematic way. Umbilicals, these are just, they have different type of armors on, on them. And then there are a set of cables that the very center of the umbilicals, which are transmitting electrical power, telemetry signals, uh, control signals. Um, so it has to be flexible as well as sturdy in a way to protect all these cables as well. Uh, this is what we call uh, umbilical is just a combination of those, as I mentioned, those cables, electrical cables, telemetry cables, control cables. Uh, and then at the end of the umbilical, what we have is called UTA, uh, umbilical termination assembly, uh, which is fastened to an umbilical. In this scenario, it will be landed on a structure next to the subsea uh, drilling unit, or uh, subsea distribution unit, and interconnected to a SDU using flying leads. Uh, this shows a typical umbilical on the installation reel prior to transportation offshore. Uh, and it can give you a relative uh, example of a uh, scale of this umbilical and the reel. Um, a typical uh, the approach, approach taken to development of the field is very much dependent on the region, as I mentioned in the very beginning of my presentation, affected by the region, by the fishing and the icebergs. So there are so many factors that affect how the fields are developed, how the wells are placed, how they are actually protected as well. Um, at the very initial, uh, on the left, you see a four well template. Uh, and on the right, you see a 24 well template. Um, we do not use them or see them as much as we used to do. Uh, most people are using clusters because obviously a template like a 24 temp well template is a huge investment. Uh, on the day one, people try to avoid that uh, because of uh, what a huge uh, up, 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 uh, upfront capital investment it is. Uh, if you use a cluster, you can kind of phase your installation over the period of time. That means you can actually move away from that you can do a pub plug and abandonment campaign. And if it's not economical to produce a cluster, you move away from it. But in terms of template, it becomes very difficult to do it. Uh, while in case of a four well template, it's not much of a upfront investment. Again, the templates are just like manifolds are connected to the pipelines and vehicles for producing fluids, injecting chemicals for hydraulic and, and then we have hydraulic and electrical controls and the communications as well. So a typical template structure, it is used for drilling wells in a very close proximity. But what you see here is a pipe 
work on this. There is a pipe work on the center, which is called guide basis for the trees and a framework that has the pipe work in it uh, and the trees that, that connects to it. Uh, the wells are drilled through a template. You can see these gray rectangles, uh, which are essentially uh, going from the formation up to the surface. Uh, and then one of the benefits of the templates is that in certain areas of the world, not just in North Sea or Norway, but also off coast of Gulf of Egypt, uh, coast of Egypt there is a requirement for the over trawlability. That means there is a lot of fishery involved. So you have to have some protection against the fishing trawling nets. In that case, your templates are uh, there to protect your wellhead. You can see it's the protect, uh, the wellhead is actually nested inside the templates. So it actually protects from, from icebergs, it protects it from the, the fishing nets. These structures are also called over trawlable structures and they are in fact housing the tree and the completion and piping and the control system inside that protected structure. And then what will happen is that your subsea tree will go right on top of it, connecting it with this pipeline right over here. The templates in shallow waters and area with common fishing uh, requirement uh, than you need. If there is, if the if the risk is higher, then in that case you have to build more protective structures around even your subsea trees to protect them. Uh, this is an example from a Texaco captain, which was a development offshore Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this is a massive, massive template. So you can see how big of an investment it is. Um, it is very hard to get a scale of this aspect, except to say that there are people on the on the template that it's 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 huge. So there, you can't see there are people standing over here. Uh, so the scale of this is just immense. Uh, glory holes. Uh, they primarily... Hassan, are you going to yeah. have time for taking questions? Because we're getting close yes, to the I'm, hour. Yes, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. By, by the way, how, how far across a field is the distance? A mile, a couple of miles, kilometers? Um, so between, between a cluster of wells, these are usually within, um, within a kilometer of each other could be a couple of kilometers. They are not certainly in hundreds of kilometers, but these fields from uh, off or onshore facility or from any piece of land, they can be hundreds and thousands of miles. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So these are what we call glory holes. Essentially what these are is this is a development right on the seabed. And this is this is not very common. It's done mostly offshore Canada uh, because of the concerns that we have with the icebergs. So the iceberg will actually float over it and protect uh, and these the subsea infrastructure will remain uh, unscattered, uh, unscratched. Uh, this is uh, my final presentation. Uh, now you can um, identify some of these uh, key components of a subsea structure. You can you can identify wellhead. You can identify uh, manifold, uh, a subsea pumping system, your subsea SDUs, your subsea distribution units. Uh, so you can see and you can appreciate how massive this operation is. It takes decades to plan. Uh, and get everything, all the resources resources in place uh, before we actually see what we call our first oil. So a lot of investment actually goes before the return actually comes in. Yeah, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, I would like yes. to take them. Let's go back to the first question I saw here. Has there ever been a blow off incident of the Christmas tree together with the ESD system? If so, how was it rectified? Uh, there, there have been some, uh, one, of the, one of the ones which I think in the very, very recent history was uh, in Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there was a blowout in, on a BP's platform. Um, it's very, very far in between. Uh, they are not very uncommon. Uh, in that case, uh, 
what we have to do is if it's a it's in a drilling phase, then as I mentioned earlier, BOP blowout preventer is a piece of equipment that we use to isolate your well head or your well from your top side. So essentially you will shear your hands, you will disconnect and you will wait or you will come back another day with a with a remedial plan. Um, it, it's, a, it's a topic of its, of its own, how do we do that? But that essentially your blowout preventer is there to, to, uh, to prevent any uncontrolled exposure of hydrocarbons to the environment. Next question. How true is it that the earth oozes oil that it produces on its own? Um, I've heard about it, to be honest, I haven't seen or uh, witnessed it firsthand, but I've heard that there are areas where there is uh, oil oozing out from the sea floor. It's not very common. I, I, can, tell, I can tell you that. Uh, okay, what's the cause of gas flaring and how can it be prevented? Very good question. It's uh, it's one of the environmental responsibilities or the environmental concerns that we always have with the offshore developments, subsea developments. Um, the gas that is produced, uh, there are a couple of ways you can handle it. You can either inject it back into the reservoir if it's possible. Uh, in that way, you don't have to worry about flaring of the gas. Sometimes it's not possible to inject back into the reservoir because of the different reasons. We, related to the formation itself. In that case, you might have to flare it, which is which is becoming less and less common, but it, it happens. Um, if you remember, in my part of my presentation, I talked about the subsea pumping. There is another aspect of subsea pumping, which is called subsea compression or a wet gas compression. Essentially what's happening is that you are taking that produced gas, you are compressing it uh, right there on the seafloor, Sometimes you do it on, on your uh, uh, semi-submersible or your product FPSO vessel, and then you transport it onshore if the pipeline capacity is available. I think that's the, the way in, that's the way we are trying to go for in the near future. Next question, is oil crude under the seabed liquid or is it like sand? Primarily, it's it's in the form of what we call light oil, medium oil. Uh, I'm not very aware of any heavy oil extractions offshore. It just becomes it becomes too expensive to extract it if it becomes a heavy oil. But it is liquid, yes, or fluid. Um, how is environmental impact prevented from this kind of operation? Uh, in fact, a very good question. There, there are uh, a lot of stigma that is uh, centered around this. Uh, um, based on my experience, there is a lot of effort that is done, especially when we actually go to the processing side of this thing, uh, where the efforts are done to ensure that produced water is either, actually either injected back into the reservoir or either it is protest, processed to a point where there, it can be actually released into the environment. Um, there, the, some of the areas around the world have very strict regulations regarding how you can dispose of that produced water. Um, so I can tell you that it's, it's, it's done in a very, very proper way. Um, however, there are certain areas which are laxed in terms of regulations. So, so there are ways to process that uh, that produce water uh, to dispose it in a in a responsible way it depends upon what kind of infrastructure infrastructure you have available next question i'm not sure i understand it maybe you do i'm interested a little bit more about the navigation if it is possible to explain a little bit more how it is regulated okay uh I can give you a very, very quick flavor. It's it's not my area of expertise in terms of like how the navigation, um, but effect, effectively your semi-submersibles and uh, your drill ships have, as I mentioned earlier, what we call a DP or dynamic positioning. It's, it's just a very, very accurate version of commercially available GPS. We are actually, we are trying to triangulate the signals, trying to get a more accurate position and then 
uh, adjusting the position of your of your drill ship or your semi submersible submersible based on that. Uh, I don't know if it if it answers your questions, but it's uh, it's 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 something um, a tiny bit away from my area of experience in terms of navigation. When you look at the storage ship, how much does it carry, and how much how much does the shuttle actually carry? Well, uh, a typically uh, FPSO can contain um, one day worth of uh, production. Typically, it can be more than that. So we are talking about anywhere between twenty to 30,000 barrels of storage available on FPSO. The shuttle tanker is certainly more than that. So that means the, the oil is flowing really fast. Oh, it is. Offshore developments, we are talking about 20,000 barrels, 30,000 barrels a day kind of thing. How much per hour? Uh, a thousand, a thousand barrels per hour, something like that? Um, likely, likely, yes. Wow. Okay, so um, let's see. Does the hydrocarbon content of oil vary across regions? And if so, is it very... Is it the very reason that make extraction expensive? Hundred percent, totally it does. Uh, the hydrocarbon content varies. Uh, also, the type of oil, uh, what we call oil water, uh, water cut (WC). It's, it's it's what commonly use used term in the industry. Uh, water cut. You want as less water as possible. So for offshore developments, it's very common to have ninety five percent pure oil with just 5% water. Uh, in onshore applications, you have higher water cuts. There are onshore wells where the, the water cut is almost like 95, 99%, just 1% oil. So yes, it does vary and does change the economics quite a lot. Do you have any sense of how much oil is left in the subsea regions? Hard to quantify that. Uh, we try to recover as much as possible, but certainly you cannot recover all of it. So, and also it depends upon economics as well. Sometimes you can actually take it to like almost 95% water cut. That means you have extracted like 95% of oil from the reservoir, but totally depends upon economics. Sometimes in offshore, it's not even feasible to do that because uh, as your water cut will increase, uh, your your production will start declining. And uh, as you saw, it's a very expensive field to maintain even. So it comes to a point where it's not even feasible to extract the rest of the oil. So they actually will leave the rest of the oil subsurface, cap it, abandon it, move on. One thing you say is, so once they identify a field where there's oil, it takes them like at least 10 years to develop that infrastructure subsea. Is that correct? Some, sometimes more than that as well. Wow. 